the dream. You have to dream the dream. You got to touch. You have to see it when nobody else sees it. You have to feel it when it's not tangible. You have to believe it when you cannot see it. You got to be possessed with the dream. The dream. Yeah. Any weapon formed against us shall not prosper. Young niggas started with oozing noodles, now we eating laughs. Uh. As I walk through the valley with my ladder and flex I'm the realest nigga in it, I just happened to rap When they all thought we was finished, they was laughing at that So I went and bought me a dawn and flipped the head to the back Fuck. Whoa, Jeff, I love that intro, bro Hey guys, John Newman here and welcome to episode 20 of Welcome to the Machine And tonight's guest, whoa, he disappeared, oh, there he is Tonight's guest is It's just a fascinating story of overcoming adversity and finding your way. It's basically how we all go through challenges in our life and we break through the other side. Author of a book called Prison to Paradise. He's a real estate agent that is just knocking the cover off the ball out of Baltimore, Maryland. Alan Upshur. Hey, Alan, how you doing tonight, bud? Doing great, doing great. Happy to be a part of the show. And, and Alan, just like every show, matter of fact, um, this is the first time we've actually had a conversation, correct? Yeah. Yep. So you have no idea what I'm going to ask you, and I have no idea what you're going to say, and that's how I like it. Let's do it. Let's do it. So in that intro, we had Eric Thomas, and let's just dive right into the book. I mean, such a powerful <laughs> title from Prison to Paradise. Like, what is all that about? Well, ultimately, the name Prison to Paradise came from where I was, I, I was incarcerated, I was in prison and ultimately I knew one day I would get out cause I didn't have life in prison. Although I was facing life, um, I, the transition of what I was going to do. Um, when I started writing a book, it, it got the idea from my father from actual first time I was in prison. Um, I know that I was going to be in there for a good amount of time. And one thing he told me was, you're going to be there. There's, there's no way you're going to get out of there. So the least you can do is record things that are going on in your life that you can look back and use as tools to not go back there. Um, so the idea of the book, as time went on, I realized that Prison of Paradise was not even a location because the, the, the most free I became was in prison. Prison of Paradise is a mentality. You know, we all have prisons that we go through. It's just in different ways. Mine just so happened to be in that location of being there. But it took for me being in that location to transition over to have a paradise mindset. I didn't know that I wanted to to find the passion that I wanted to pursue in life until being in that state of mind. So both of them are a state of mind. And I just use my personal story, although we all have our own, to utilize that as fuel to overcome our prison moments. So prison to paradise is a transition of the mind over to live a better life, not just for you, but for the community as well. So what you just said was you actually felt like you were freed while you were in prison? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because from a mindset standpoint, like, like what I, you know, just to be very clear, I think to the audience is saying there are many of us that are out there that are in mental prison every single day. You just have to be behind bars. Absolutely. And then there- you experience freedom. I experience freedom because then I, re- I really had time to really know myself. What do I want? Why am I here? Who am I living for? These questions I didn't ask myself until I was in a situation where I had all the the distractions from the world taken away from me. All the alcohol, all the women, all the crimes that I committed were not being done. And the only thing I could focus on was me. So it took for me to lose everything to focus on me. And then when I started focusing on me, I started to realize this is why I'm here. This is why I did this. This is why I didn't do that. This is where I get joy from. So the joy came at my lowest point in life. It just so happened to be being there. But you have to use your negative moments. You won't find joy. You won't find a peace of mind until you're in a place of chaotic and I mean, in a chaotic environment. You won't find it. And I'm just gearing the book for us to really focus in on those pains that we all go through. So, so I mean, just for the audience. Um... Because everybody's asking, so why? How how did you end up in prison? Like, how did you get to the point um, where you were in that environment? Okay, so I actually been in prison twice. So the first time, and, and both times, crazy enough, I was in college. I was a bio major the first time with a four point GPA. 
Second time I was an exercise science major with a 4.0 GPA. And it was like, I always been an adrenaline junkie. Like I've always loved to seek new thrills or new adventures. And since a child, I was always pugnacious. Like I, I was always fond of fighting since I was a child. And on the flip side of that, I love education. So as time went on, the snowball effect just grew. I, I love to read more as years went, went by. I love to get involved in more fights or getting daring situations as I grew older. And as I grew older, once I reached that high school, college era, I had all the freedom in the world. It wasn't no parents there. It was just me. So I could do whatever I wanted to do. And um, the winter time of 2006 was when I had my college break at Bowie State University. And uh, a group of us was going around robbing people. You know, I just got a thrill out of it. And uh, Valentine's Day, I was doing that for about, for about four or five months. And then Valentine's Day came and the police came, they locked me up. Um, fast forward, long story short, I got put out of Bowie State and I was trying to go to University of Maryland Eastern Shore as a way to save myself. And the judge pretty much said, hey, who, would, who else would you be involved with? The only name they had was mine. And ultimately, the judge gave me three years. So I went to prison my first time on a felony robbery. Um, when I got out of there, when I was in there, let me start while I was in there. My whole focus was just getting out. I didn't care about anything but getting out. I wasn't trying to learn myself. It was, okay, I messed up and I got sent to prison. I'm in boot camp. Let me just get out of there. That's all I was focused on. And when I got out of prison, you know, I kind of felt like, okay, well, that really wasn't too bad as opposed to really learning my lesson of why I got Hold on. You Like that wasn't too bad? Like, like prison wasn't too bad? After a couple months go by, it's like, okay, you was there. You know, I was still 18, so I'm still growing. I'm young. You know, it was an experience. I did 18 and a half months, but I'm back in college. I actually, not only did I go back to college, I actually got um, accepted to University of Maryland Eastern Shore in the honors dorm room because of my grades previously. So they totally overlooked that I was incarcerated, but they seen what my grades were and they accepted me on a pretty much a scholarship in the honors dorm room. Wow. So it's like, yeah, I've been in prison, but now look at me. I'm back in college. I'm, a, I'm an honor student at that. Let me just be smart and not um, rob this time. So you know what I decided to do this time? Because I know Robin was going to send me to prison. I said, let me get smart and sell drugs. So now I'm back in college. Um, my grades are great. I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing stuff for the community inside the college. So I'm looked at like as this model student. But outside of college, I'm selling drugs. I'm selling pounds from Salisbury University to Ocean City. You know, I'm just selling a whole bunch of weed. So I'm, I'm not really hurting anybody now. Me selling drugs, you know, it, it's not too bad. Ultimately, irony struck. Someone tried to rob me. The first thing I went to prison for, some, come, came back around a boomerang effect, and someone pulled a gun out and tried to rob me. Long story short, I stabbed him to get away, and next thing you know, I'm back facing an attempted murder. So now we're not talking about a three-year sentence. We're talking about life, and the judge was trying to give me that because <laughs> the guy survived. I, I missed his heart by three millimeters, and he survived. You know, the gun, I mean, the knife went from the back of his body to the front. And uh, ultimately, it, it was it was a, it was a messy scene, you know, to say the least. Um, he told on me a lot of people was, you know, as witnesses saying that I did it. And it was it was like my life just came to, to an end, you know, like everything that I worked for, you know, as far as trying to build my education aspect, this part of my life, like overruled that. And now I'm a criminal and, you know, the lawyer's not sounding too positive and I'm just in a crazy situation. Like it was just unreal to me. I couldn't believe it. You know, I went from this 4.0 college student to, you know, yeah, I was selling drugs. I didn't think it was a big deal to, whoa, I'm in here cause I just stabbed somebody and he almost died. And they're saying that I did it. And my lawyer is sweating bullets from every time I see him and he doesn't think I'm gonna beat this, <laughs> you know? So, so um, what, what are you facing at that, at that point in time? I was facing life in prison. First degree attempted murder, second degree attempted murder. Both carry life. The next charge is first degree attempt. That carries 25 years. Then the next one goes to 10 and then three and then two. Um, second degree assault, reckless endangerment, dangerous weapon with intent to injure. Those are my charges, you know. Um, and ultimately, the only choice I had, I think my, my best plea that they gave me was like 17 years, no parole. It went from trying to offer me life a couple times, then I think it went to 30. Then they said 17, no parole. And I said, man, I'm this age, I'm 22 years old. I'm not, I can't take that. I got to take this to trial. And I know that if I lose this trial, 
I'm going to be in prison for the rest of my life. You know, Crap. it was a crazy trial. It was a long, drawn-out trial, but I ended up getting 11 years, and they sent me out to a maximum security prison out Cumberland. And then it was there. It really hit me like, whoa, <laughs> I'm back in prison, but it's not no small little time now. We're talking about 11 years with people all around me that got double life, life, 75 years, 50 years. And it took for me at that moment to really start appreciating my education. You know? And uh, during that time, being incarcerated, I needed a way to free my mind because at first I would try to sleep it away. I would sleep every day. And literally it was 200 and I think 11 days I try to sleep my time away. I will only go to breakfast, only go to lunch, miss dinner, and I would try to sleep all my time away. And I so much body being pain, like my, my neck, my back was in so much pain. I couldn't sleep it away. Also, I, I got to find a way to free my mind, and I did it through reading. Uh, I've spent over twelve hundred days incarcerated. I probably read about eleven hundred books. You wow. know, I read everything from a. It is. I read the Bible eight times front to back, the Quran. Uh, I studied Mandarin, uh, Deepak Chopra, Walt Disney. I read every Forbes magazine I can get my hands on. And I real estate after real estate, uh, I, I just, it freed my mind. I could get away from where I was. I turned prison into a college. You know, every day I woke up, it was like, okay, now I got to study this because I know I'm coming home. And I would study the law, study my case and even the parole board, everyone was saying, you're going to do at least seven and a half, eight years on that 11. And I turned that into three and a half and got my, my time overturned and came home. You know, how did they, how did, how did you get the sentence reduced? I mean, or maybe it's not a sentence. How did you go so from? I actually, found, I actually found a, I don't want to say it was a loophole, but I did see a small opening in the law. Um, studying my case, I know that my ultimate charge was second degree assault. Second degree assault carries 10 years in Maryland. Um, you have to do at least 25% of your time to be eligible for parole if it's your first offense. Same as those mine, I had to do 33% of my time, which means on 11 years, it was like three and some change. So it was my job to make sure that I fit all the criteria in line so I could be the perfect candidate for parole. So I made myself a tutor. I was teaching people how to read and write. Um, I made sure I went to rehab classes because I did have a severe alcohol problem. Um, prior. So I made sure I studied and did all my classes for that. Um, I made sure I did other extracurricular activities like study Mandarin. So I had all my, uh, all the, all the um, mm, study guys that I wrote um, time and time again, for different symbols showing that I use my time efficiently because I know one day I'll go up for my parole hearing. Now, another thing that helped me was second degree assault, even though I stabbed somebody, technically by law, if you read the law, Second degree assault is considered a nonviolent charge to the parole board. So even if you beat somebody with a bat, if you get second degree assault, it's still considered nonviolent, which means you can still go up in front of the parole board 25% of your time, in my case, 33%. So I played these laws and I also found a small little paragraph that was a program called the Public Safety Compact Program, that if you are a nonviolent offender and you are willing to abide by these rules to come home, we'll give you a shot to come home. So I had all this when I went in front of the parole board. I had my whole game plan. I want to come home, get my real estate license. I want to start my own company. I had all this in front of them lined up, and they gave me a shot. I did three and a half years on 11. They was they was in awe for all the stuff that I did while I was incarcerated, and I just took that, and I never looked back. So, with, so it's kind of weird, and you said it. Your first time you went was for armed robbery, and then the second time you went was because you were a victim of armed robbery. Um, <laughs> it's kind of ironic. What um, yeah. now is that? It almost sounds like the way you were. It was like armed robbery, which for you was almost like. Did you need money at the? Was it was it a money thing? Like I need to rob somebody because I need money, or was it like okay? Was it purely because of ad adrenaline? It was the crowd. I honestly, it? honestly, it was the adrenaline first. Money was a bonus. You know, if you get in, if you love what you're doing, you're getting paid for it. I mean, it's hard to stop that. You know, that's like a freight train. You know, so it was like crazy enough, like to hit somebody in the mouth or to get away with you know the violence or getting away with things. It was just like a. It was like its own drug. It was like I was addicted to that. You know, um, and, and even to this day, like I found a way to curve my mind to be able to I'm still selling. I'm still a salesman. I just right. do it by selling houses. When I hear the clear to close or when a client 
closes a house or I'm battling through a negotiation and they finally say yes. It's the same thrill I had when I was selling drugs or the police behind me, hope they don't put the lights on or it's the same feeling, yeah. you know? So it's like, I'm just doing it legally now. When the police get behind me now, I don't have to worry. You know, they're going to pull me over. They can pull me over and search my car. All they'll see is contracts and pens and business cards, you know? So the, the idea of the book is to use your pains, use these things that we go through because there's silver lining in everything that we all go through. You use that as your fuel for your passion and you can achieve anything, you know? That's the concept of my book, Prison of Paradise. Now, you, you grew up in Baltimore City, correct? Yes, sir. So how much of, let's just call it a lifestyle, was was a function of the environment that you grew up? Was, did, did your environment growing up have anything to do with any of this? Yes. But ultimately, well, yes, it did. When I, starting, off, starting off as a child, you know, I had like two group of friends and we would always go around and fight. I'm talking about this is like six years old. I'm young. And, and then I loved it. You know, uh, thank God for my parents. They still in my life to this day. They put me in private school. And in the private school aspect, I wasn't really getting in any trouble. It was the thrill of the education now. It was the battle of my mind, being able to get straight A's over these other students that was around me, making sure I crushed my homework assignments. Like that was my new fight. So as growing up, it was public school, private school, public school, private school. It was like every time I was in a public school setting, it was more like a little bit more wilder. I got in more trouble because it's, it's a bigger school. Um, it's more people around. And it, it was clearly a difference. It was a distinct difference. Uh, and it was just as I grew older, both of those things evolved. The crime aspect evolved and the education aspect evolved. So it definitely plays a big part because it was just like you've seen it. You know, people getting in fights, people getting suspended. It was like the norm, you know, growing up. Oh, okay, he got in trouble. You know, it wasn't like it was like, oh, my God, he got in trouble. You know, so that environment aspect of getting in trouble is like was like a norm growing up. You see it in all the time. I had family that got in trouble all the time. So it was like it really wasn't that bad. It kind of made you numb when you got in trouble. So the environment definitely plays a part. Definitely. So and ultimately what I hear you say is, is you found a way to channel that that energy into something that I guess society would deem to be productive. I mean, you basically, it's the same thrill. It's the same drug. It's the same adrenaline, but you just found a different way to channel it. Yes. I imagine coming out of, of prison and now you're like, okay, I, I have these dreams. Now I'm going to pursue stuff. How many people did you have telling you? Yeah, right. That's not going to happen. Like I would say about 95% of them. So what and, kept and you going? I've had mentors. The key, the key to that, that was that was a great question. Having mentors. When I was incarcerated, I didn't do it by myself. I've had the the ones that were my mentors were the people who were never coming home. They had 75 years, one of them had life, they were older, they was like in their 50s. And I listened to them. You know, they was like, you know, you're you're in your 20s, you got a chance to come home. You can do this, you can do that. And it was like, it inspired me because the way they were living, they were all successful guys, master electrician. Um, one was a contractor. Matter of fact, crazy enough, all of them were in the real estate field. Now I think about it. So that kind of made me listen to them. I kind of could relate like, hey, I want to get in the real estate. And they threw their lives away. <laughs> they threw their lives away for anger, which is what kind of got me in there in the first place. Um, greed, the same thing I was in there for. So it was like, wow, you in a sense made it. So you made it. They had made it in their lives. But these aspects that weren't controlled, they never coming home. And all they was doing was giving me jewels. They had no reason to lie to me. They never coming home. Right. You know, so it was like, I'm like, wow. And they would sh show me different books to read. You know, um, one of them got me in with Deepak Chopra. I love Deepak Chopra. He's one of my favorite authors. And, you know, studying him and even studying Buddhism. Um, really put me in a, a peace of mind where I, I actually, what well, you can't you can't go too far one way or the other. You know you got to keep balancing everything that you have in life, and I really learned that through, through Buddhism, um, and that put me in a real calm state of mind. Um, you know, actually, I, I I still study other religions, but that's that might be one of my favorites. Um, so that the peace really came from really studying that a lot and reading um, certain books like. Uh, Sid Hawther and the Alchemist by Paul Hello. Um, but it was the peace of mind, man. I didn't get I didn't have a peace of mind when I was home. 
That's why I was always drinking. That's why I was always fighting. That's why I was always, even though I had all the money in the world, I was not at peace, man. You know, I could, I would be grinding all day. I would see all this money. Like, yeah, you know, I had my arrogant moments. But then when I'm alone, it was like, got to be more to life than this. <laughs> That's why I would ask myself, like, this can't be it, you know. So, but being in prison, and it took me about two years, but it was like, I'm okay. Because every day y'all keep me in here, I'm going to become more and more of a monster. I'm going to evolve more and more. And when I get home, I'm going to have the craziest impact ever. So that's how I tricked my mind because at first it was like, damn, all these days going by, you know, I'm missing the world, I'm missing the world. Then I put in my mind, oh, damn, I just read this book. I just got this book. I know this. I know that. I know this. So every day they keep me in here, I'm just going to evolve and be stronger and stronger and stronger. And then it was like, ultimately, you know, the jail started saying it. I was evolved. I was so engulfed in the books I read that everywhere I went, the cafeteria, the yard, um, even when I went to like to health or get transferred to go somewhere. I always had a book. Like I've always had a book at all times. I was always studying, always reading. Even to this day, it's just different now because we got technology. I could read, look at it on Google and stuff. But I stayed with a book, man. And that was my way out. It was education that got me out. Because if I didn't educate myself, if I didn't study my case or study loopholes or take my time to the library, to this day, I would still be in there. And he would not have known who I was. You know, I would not be a real estate agent. It got denied the first time. I had to read the hearing, see what I had to do, strategize, go back in front of the board with everything I did since I was home. And then they gave me my real estate license. I didn't just sell 41 houses because, oh, I'm a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a handsome guy. No, I had to study late nights, three, four in the morning, five in the morning. How can I do this? What did I do wrong? Even to this day, I do it. You know, I got rookie of the year. I'm not satisfied with that. A Baltimore City rookie of the year last year. What's next? Now, now what? You know, that was last year. I got dust on that trophy right now. What about now? What am I going to do now? So every day I got a hunger out of this world because I just go back and I remember where I was. I was that guy facing life in prison where people wrote me off because I'm a, I'm a F up. I'm a fuck up, basically. So I <laughs> use that as my tool every single day. You know, like even today alone. Um, I just came back from vacation today and I got two offers that I wrote. One, I got it right. Got one contract accepted and about to have another one accepted, hopefully by nine in the morning. You know, I'm not satisfied. I'm not going to ever stop, you know, so. So w- would you say that you have in, in any way a chip on your shoulder? Yes, I do. I got multiple chips on my shoulder. It's not <laughs> just one. You know, you can have a party off my shoulder. I got chips everywhere. <laughs> so, where do they where do those come from because i because i know that if i decide to stop that i can go back you know um and, and talking to my father my father makes it so clear because he's my father so um when we have conversations now as opposed to back then you know i i get it you know i i have like a I got to be doing something, you know, because it, it may be because, you know, I, I was an addict when I when I was, you know, an alcohol or, you know, the thriller when I was breaking the law. You know, if I if you have idle time, you know, idle time become can become wickedness. You know, you're not doing something, especially when you have been through, you know, some of the things that I've been through or anybody for that matter. If you are, aren't being productive to try to achieve your goals, what are you doing? You're going backwards. You're hustling backwards. So, you know, I, I got I got to keep myself moving, you know, hearing it from my father. My father had his situations where he dealt with drugs in the past and, you know, talking to him, you know, he like, man, the reason why I, I hustle so hard is because, you know, I don't want to fall back to how I used to be. You know, it can happen. You know, I'm not I'm not you no know, Superman. Like it can happen if I if I decide to say, hey, you know, what? I don't want to I don't want to uh, keep writing books. So I don't want to do real estate no more. What am I saying? These two things are my passion. So if I'm not pursuing my passion or if someone is not pursuing their passion, they're going backwards and going backwards leads to ultimately death. It's just how how the cookies crumble on you going backwards, you know, going backwards for me, knowing I got four years of parole over my head means if I slip up, hit somebody in the mouth because I'm angry. Guess what? That rookie of the year, this conversation, me being an author, those 54 clients I just sold, there was 10 clients who waiting on me to get a house right now. That all goes to an end. Everything that I say is in vain. That's another guy who was on the right path and he gave up and went back to prison. So it, it sounds to me like you're very clear. Like this isn't, this is a life or death situation almost. Like it, it you, you hit it right on the money. Right it, on it, the- 
it there's no in between it is it gotta work <laughs> it has to work if it doesn't work then i'm yeah that's that's what it is it's kind of like when 50 cents said get rich or die trying then that's that's what it's going that's what it'll be because i will slip back and i will go back to how i used to be i know that so i gotta go this hard and i'll go this hard until i die i'm okay with that so you know it, it's got to be and it's, it's almost like once you've seen the bottom and, you know, I've experienced a lot of pain and trauma and, and, and just stuff that's happened in my life. I, I haven't been incarcerated for a period of time, but I've been through some stuff. But coming out of that stuff, I don't have any fear anymore. Like, it's like, what are you going to what are you going to do to me? Like, I've, I've seen the bottom. Like, you think yeah. I'm worried about that small stuff? Like, it's, really? it's liberating in a way. It is. It is. I, I I I clearly remember when the the trial of my life, man, and you know, it was some of the stuff that prosecutor the prosecutor was a slick talking dude, man. I just knew I was going to prison for the rest of my life because he was just my lawyer was cool, but that prosecutor, man, I can't remember his name now, but he was on it. He made me sound like the worst guy you could think of. <laughs> College by day, attempted murderer by night. He's already smart. He's a 4.0 bio student, so he knows the body. He knew where to stab the guy. All he does is he's a he's a, 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 um, a bookworm, so you know he already has nothing to do but mastermind different things. Do you really want this guy out in the community? He's selling drugs all throughout community, but he makes, he makes it seem like he's this model student, and he's stabbing people right next to a church. That's how they made me sound. So the jury, I, I just was like, I don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I went back to the holding cell, and they and they was doing uh, deliberations. Cause they say that the longer the better. Man, I was in deliberations probably for like ten minutes. <laughs> I got right on my knees. I'm like, man, <laughs> it's over. <laughs> and I remember looking up. You know, we all have our moments where we look up, and I'm just like, God, if you get me out of this, I promise I will go as hard as possible to be as productive as I can, and you will never have to worry about me going back to prison again. If you get me out of this, and kind of got me out, because I was facing life. I got 11 years, but hey, look at me now. Three and a half, I'm out, you know, and... uh, But while while you were in there, though, and and you put in a ton of work. You didn't didn't go to jail (laughs) and go to the gym every day and work out. I mean, you worked out, but you worked out your mind. Not You may have worked out your body, too, but you did you looked at that and said okay how do i make the most out of a bad situation yeah. and you used i mean if you read books read books read books read books basically you became not that college didn't educate you but you became i became more knowledgeable through prison than college prison did way more than me than college could ever do because it was real life situations it was survival it was if you talk to the wrong person you could die you got gangs everywhere. You got MS-13, you got Crips, Bloods, you name it. They all there. If you say the wrong thing to the wrong person, that could cost you your life. You know, so, so it, was like it was the, it was the, because, you know, for a living, all I do is speak to people. You know, I close deals. That's what I do for a living. So you can only imagine being in this type of environment, trying to maneuver through conversation, through body language, knowing where to go, how to go, how to move. It's, it was just more chest like you take that same mentality because I was the guy that not only did I read, like you see, I wrote a book. I will always write notes, strategize, play chess with myself, talk to myself. How did I, how can I do this better? What can I do that? And then I take that same thing to this day. You know, I might close a deal with a client, but then I'm thinking about all the negative stuff. How did that, how did, how could have closed this five days earlier? How did this go wrong? What can I do next time? And I just take that same concept but I put it in life or death. You know, if I get a client, I look at it like it's life or death. I think they said my mic is off. Yeah, it's just, uh, there it was. It's clear now. Okay. Yeah, so I just look at it like it's life or death. You know, I look at, so this is my career. I carry it like it's life or death. You know, I'm not just selling a client a house. We're going to war together. You know, my clients will tell you, when we get a house, we're going to war. We're going to get you this house. By any means, we're going to go to war. I'm going to fight to the end. You know, sometimes I get in it with lenders, you know, uh, title companies, listing agents. But at the end of the day, my client's happy. We got the deal. I'm a buyer's agent. I protect my buyer. We go into war together. You know, a lot of times the clients that I have, they need grant money or they need me to work, you know, certain numbers so they can have a good mortgage or 
have or they might be a little short on clothing, so I gotta break the numbers to their favor. And I love doing it. I love for them putting that trust into me and we go into battle together. You know, that's how I look at it. So that's fascinating. And if anybody out there is watching, you have any questions, Alan, are you okay answering any questions that people any ask? Question. Any question. Hey Jeff, so if anybody has any questions, just uh serve them up. Alan, I, I think what you said and, and I love that is it's through adversity that we actually learn the most. If, if we're willing to look at the adversity and not pity ourselves, that's where the growth comes. And, and it goes back to, it's why we need to fail. Like we need to fail in life to reach success because Absolutely. It's, They're best friends. Moments. success and failure are best friends. They need each other. It's, it's just, it's too much success that'll make you drunk. You can't learn from success. If you're always winning, how, how can you strategize on how to get better? All you see is the wins. You know, it makes you think of um the the, the Patriots that year when they went undefeated and they lost in the Super Bowl. They was winning so much. What could they really strategize? They always winning. What are they doing wrong? And the Super Bowl comes, they get thrown off and they lose. You know, you need the losses. You can't learn from wins. How can you? You won. Right. Right. Yeah. You won. You feel like it's over. You won. It's like getting drunk off alcohol. You know, you're drunk. You know, you need something to sober you up. And sober, and that's what losses do. They sober you up. Does it ever upset you when you see people that haven't gone through adversity and they complain? No, because even I do it sometimes. We all do it. You know, we all have our moments where, you know, we, we get ahead of ourselves. You know, even me, like I, I close like three straight house deals. I'm like, yeah, you know, I have to close three. Let me go on vacation. But then you got to remember, then you snap back. You know, once something happens, you snap back. So, I wouldn't say that because we all have it. We all go through it. You know, we just got to remember that we all go through it. What What will you tell people now? Because in a way, I, I would imagine that you look back on your prison term and you're grateful for it. And in a weird way, it's like I'm I, grateful I, for that. I needed it. <laughs> I needed. I needed it because the path I was going, it only would have got worse. You know, I was at a point where I was making so the guy that tried to rob me. Let's just say that he decided not to, and he waited six months down the road. The path I was going, I was only making more and more money. You know, I was trying to get to the point where I'm making $50,000 a week. I, that's what I wanted to make a week. So imagine if I already got one person that's trying to rob me on a low scale. Imagine who else is going to start watching. The feds, real stick-up boys who may not just try to pull, the, I mean, pull a gun out, but really try to kill me, you know, or not even kill me, grab my family. You know, when you get to that scale, it's different type of enemies. It's different type of battles, you know, or maybe the alcohol was what killed me. I'm drinking a lot. I'm drinking multiple beers a day. I'm drinking um, paint after paint a day, you know, so maybe maybe my liver would have gave out. You know, it's just so much that would have happened that leaves factors out, and I'm just so big on the universe. You know, the universe – always gives you signs. It will not never give you a sign. The universe will always give you what you want. Always. Just a matter of you realizing it or not. You know, if you if you have a, a negative mentality and you keep saying what if or I don't know if this is going to happen, the universe is going to give you that what if. You know, if you feel like, uh, I don't, if you don't feel confident, the universe isn't going to feel confident. You know, so the only thing is when you when you have a goal in mind, you have to realize that what comes with the goal is obstacles. Obstacles are, they're both best friends. So if you say you want this goal, you got to be able to go through the best friend. <laughs> so if you can go through the best friend, then you'll get the other side of the best friend, which is the goal. The harder the goal is, the harder his best friend is, which is the obstacle, you know, because they're hand in hand. The more joy you want out of life, the more sacrifice you got to put in because they're hand in hand. And that's what Buddhism taught me. So, so what do you believe holds people back? <sighs> Pain. The pain that they know they got to go through, you know, it's like if you know that you're going to go through pain to get here, you know, that, that's what stops people. I don't want to go through that pain. You know, I got I'm OK with my job right here, making 40,000 an hour. If I jump out and, 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 and live and pursue my passion, I might be broke for six months. I don't want to be broke for six months because I like this car or I like living this way. I'm scared of that sacrifice, you know, so it's the pain. It's the pain that's going to come by you achieving that goal because you will not get it absolutely will not get it without pain and if you try to now you're taking a shortcut will come with shortcuts come even more pain than what you would have gotten in the first place right so and, and once again to go back to prison is a blessing and you have to look at 
you have to look at all of your adversities like they're truly blessings because what pain like dude you you came out of prison it's like okay what pain, <laughs> what pain are you going to bring me i was in prison i had to worry about this guy stabbing me like what yeah yeah you're right and I, now, now you know i laugh about that sometimes because i even myself i'm actually about to go to my car so uh, my phone don't die if i can still talk to you but yeah even even like certain things like i'll get upset now in real estate like oh how, how did it still fall apart man and i'll be old i'll be on myself so bad and i'll be like man i've been through way worse than this man i'm over here complaining because i i complain you know i complain I, I i pity myself sometimes you know so you know i, I i'm not perfect so when something goes wrong, I'm all on myself, you know. I had a couple of deals, man. It almost brought me to tears that I couldn't close. <laughs> really, I get, I get passionate, man. I love, I love this, man. I, I, I don't want to cuss on here. I know, you know, I don't want to. No more Facebook Live, but I, I, I want to cuss a couple. But, but yeah, man, I, I love this, man. Well, it, it's got to be. The pain has to be really, really different. I mean. The pain has to be really, really difficult to come from, and I don't know what a cell is, eight by eight, 10 by 10, you're eating shitty yeah, food. Man. I mean, Real shitty food. The, the pain can't be that great, like not closing a deal compared to where I've been. And, 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 once, you've been, and once again, once you've been to the bottom, dude, I, I remember having to look around my house at a point in time when the market crashed for you know, gift cards. Like, did I have... <laughs> A dollar left on this gift card because I needed to buy formula for my kids. Like, I've been to that place. Like, dude, everything else is easy compared to that. Like, when, when right. you go into a, a, a Target and be like, okay, I got 10 gift cards. I got 30 cents on this one. I have 90 cents on this one. And then you're cutting coupon. I came home one time and, and my, uh, my daughter had a certain type of formula that she had to have. Well, I found a coupon for like, it was either Similac or Enfamil. And I don't remember which one she used. I think she used Similac. Well, I found a coupon for Enfamil. And I'm like, well, dude, I got to buy a different formula because I only have enough gift cards to get that formula. Like when you have to, when you have to take money out of your son's piggy bank to pay bills and then face your son and tell him that you can't buy stuff because you used his money. And, and that's, that's small stuff. Like, but when you go through enough right. pain, life becomes easy. Like life becomes really easy when you go through a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. And I look at, and I was, I was just looking at. Uh, I like to look at like people's stories. You know, like uh, there's so many people, man. And if you look at how before they became successful, where they were, you know, like I was just looking at DJ Cali's story. He was living out of his car, man. Guy was struggling, man, just trying to make a couple of dollars just to DJ. He didn't really have no money. He was living out of his car. Any, any opportunity he had to DJ, man, it was like, he looked at it like that was his last shot. I need this to make, to make it to get to the next day. And now look at him, you know? So it was like, we all had the stories. We all have them. We all have them. It's just a matter of using it. You got to use it. It was a commercial that just came on Gatorade that I love with Michael Jordan. It was Michael Jordan, Matt Ryan, um, J.J. Watts, and they, and they were just talking about uh, use your defeat as your fuel. And it started off with Michael Jordan talking about how he uh, got cut from his varsity basketball team. And um, it showed Serena Williams, and she said, uh, what she said? She said, to be on the wrong end of the biggest game in your sport, to be on the wrong end of the biggest upset of, in the biggest game of your sport. But she's a great athlete. But she had that, can you imagine that moment? When she had, she was way up in the game and lost, completely lost. Or Matt Ryan when he was up, I think it was like twenty-eight to three to Tom yeah. Brady, and I then lost, you lose. I lost a lot you of money. Lose? Come on, man. That's a that's tough. I I tell you what, he's gonna be in my fantasy next year, Matt Ryan. I promise you that. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> For real, man. Those are the people you gotta, you know, you gotta see. Cause when I first got in real estate, my thing was all these people got way more experience than me, but are they going to be up four in the morning like me? You know, I'm going to be up four in the morning. I have a client. I mean, I might even call a client one o'clock, two o'clock. Like, Hey, I'm sorry, but I know you was looking for a house, you know, eight o'clock account. I'll show it to you. You know, I can work Saturday. That was my line. I'll work on Saturdays, Sundays, 
Call me anytime. No secretary. You'll get me, and I'll come. I may not be the most experienced, but I got the heart, and I'm going to fight for you to the end. And clients loved it, man. They loved it. So basically what you took the strategy is that I will just outwork you. Like I will just yeah. outwork anybody that's out there. Yes. You can be better. You might know more about the house, the square footage, and slick with the tongue, fancy, but I'm going to keep working. When we get this house on the contract, I'm going I'm to talk to the appraiser. I'm going to talk to the lender. I'm going to talk to everybody I got to get my hands on. And if you short money, I'll, I'll cut my commission check to help you close your house. I've done it multiple times. We're going to get that house. Nothing's going to stop. If you if you fifty hundred, two hundred, three hundred dollars short, I will cut my money out to make sure you get that house. You know, so because in my mind, I was broke. I didn't have no money. I was living in my mother's basement, like it was counting change just to catch the bus. So if I got to cut a two thousand dollar check, three hundred dollars because you short three hundred dollars to get the get a house, I don't give a damn. You, you got still, that? You Let's still get made, fucking house. Yeah, you still made seventeen hundred bucks. At yeah. the end of the day, you still made seventeen hundred bucks, and the client's happy as shit because I did that for them. Right, and they're going to tell three other people. So that seventeen hundred now just turned to fifty four hundred. It's a no brainer. So, so what advice? I mean, there's there's quite a few people that are watching this that are in real estate. What advice do you give someone that's brand new? I don't care whether it's real estate or it's any business because the truth of the matter yeah. is, business is business. So, someone that's brand new, they're launching their business. What advice do you give that person? They need multiple mentors who are strong in whatever suit of business that they're in. So in real estate, I've had more than one mentor. I had, all of them are strong in their own particular areas, but weak in others. So when you are in a business, whatever business that it may be, you need somebody who has that experience. That experience you can't teach. You, 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 you got to learn that from somebody who is willing to help you with that. But then you got some mentors who are great teachers, but their time is limited, which is a lot of them. So you got to be able to spread that and have about four or five different mentors. For example, in real estate, you might have one who's very great on contracts, one who's a great negotiator, the other one who's good at being a team player and leveraging his time with other people. You need to talk to all of them because he's not going to always be available, so you got him. He's not going to be available, so you always got him. So what I did to be able to sell 41 houses my first year was to be able to keep picking their brains. When he's not available, I, I go to him. If he's not available, I go to him. And next thing you know, I'm closing deals. They're giving me referrals. They're giving me knowledge. So I'm growing way faster because I'm always surrounded by one of those mentors. If you have a mentor, you can grow way faster. The Karate Kid wasn't just a movie. That was a movie about learning from your mentor, putting your own touch on it, and then becoming successful. So you got to have mentors. You cannot be successful in any business if you have no mentors. It won't last for so long. You'll burn out. Did did you work? I mean, how many hours do you think that you put in, in your on an average week in your first year in real estate? <laughs> um, a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It wasn't too many days. It wasn't too many days I slept. <laughs> it, really, it really wasn't, you know, because it was like I'm always watching these guys from selling all these houses, and it's like it's endless. Like I don't got, I don't work no nine to five. I could wake up tomorrow, and I can have five people that want to buy houses, and I could potentially make twenty thousand dollars. You know, I could potentially make fifty thousand in a month. It's endless. So to be at a job where all I got to do is close deals, and I love to close deals anyway, it's kind of hard to sleep, man. You know, and you can wake up and you don't have to worry about somebody telling you, hey, you got to be here at this time. I could be wherever I want at any given time. And can't nobody tell me nothing. I can go anywhere I want at any time. It's freedom. I got the personal freedom that I always wanted. I just did it the wrong way. Wow. that's that's enough. So what do you do next? Like, what do you, I mean, is real estate your end game or, or what's the end game, you know, for you? Like, wh- So I do want to, well, I like to say there is no true end game, um, but as far as, yeah, so if you want to say from a real estate perspective, I'll always be doing this for the rest of my life. It's just going to be a matter of how I will be doing real estate. I know ultimately I won't always be a buyer agent, but I want to have people in place. I want to have an army of me's out. Um, I was just joking with my cousin about having, and it's, it sounds like it's a joke now, but I might actually do it, um, like having a boot camp of only hiring like, highly ambitious agents and putting them through a boot camp in a sense 
you know, bang through the mud. You got to climb in the mud. They might say, hey, Alan, you got me rolling in the mud because that's that's what I had to go through. You know, I want to I wanna know where you're at with it. Where's your heart at? If a client bill is about to die, are you going to up and quit? Are you going to keep fighting for them? So to start like a boot camp army sense for a brokerage, I feel like these brokerages are great. I love different schemes of them. But you don't got a, a real estate brokerage where you got to go through a boot camp just to, just to get in the door. I, I mean, imagine if you're trying to buy a house and you know that you got this highly trained guy who's been climbing ropes, running, jogging, and he's about to be your agent act up. And you're about to try to buy a house. That energy in itself is going to make you feel so hype, whether you're buying an $80,000 house or $500,000 house, because you got it through Alan Upshur's boot camp agent. He's ready to go. Whatever your obstacle is. He's gonna drop. He even drop down and give you thirty before y'all start looking for a house. That's the type of, That's what I want. I want that more. I want that motivation all over. I want brokerages like that. You know, when I write books, I want people to be hyped up, amped up. You know, ultimately, I want to be like an icon for people who have given up and have hope to keep going. You know, when I die, I want that to be said. Like even at my funeral, you're gonna feel amped up walking through the door. Like, yeah, I'm at Alice's funeral. I'm going to go hard just because he died. You know, I'm a, what I wanted to do, now I'm going to get it done. You know, just I, that's the energy that I want to always have and put people in, and that's what I want to be remembered by on this planet. You know, the hype guy, the guy who's been through it, got a whole bunch of chips on his shoulder, and now he's just motivating the fucking planet. That's how I want to go out. That's how I want to go out. So, you know, at the, at the beginning of the show, we played a and, – and I'm a huge Eric Thomas fan – and we played a small clip from Eric Thomas. But what I just heard you say is when you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, like you want those people, like you want them to go through that yeah. kind of pain. Those are agents also going to be on my team. And then, you know, if you can't make the cut, go to Century 21, go to Remax, go to Keller Williams, man. This ain't for you. This ain't for you. There's other brokerage. This one ain't for you. You know, that's, that's what I want. So, Alan, I do. You, I don't think you have any kids, correct? No kids. Nope. All right. So, let's forecast yeah. forward, and let's just say that you have kids at some point in the near future. What advice are you going to give to your kids? Read, save your money, and you know you can achieve anything. That's the main three. You know, um, well, there's more. But, you know, that they got to have they got to be spiritually based on some aspect. You know, I'm not going to force Christianity or any religion on them, but they got to they, they got to be in touch with their spirit. man. you know, the world, we're all connected. I truly believe we're all connected around certain people. You feel certain good energy from you can tell when people have bad moves without them saying anything. So mm-hmm. being able to, you know, read and be educated, man, because that's what that's what saved my life, man. You know, my father telling me to read and the importance of reading, you know, that's going to continue on, you know, saving your money, you know, saving your money gets you out of crazy situations, you know, um, and be able to, you know, use that. If, you, if you're educated and you save your money, you can really go so far with it and be able to achieve whatever you want. You don't have to be stuck and working for somebody else. You know, um, if you want to, I can't stop you, but you can be, you can be, you can do whatever you want, you know, whatever they want to do, you can, you can do it. And can't nobody stop nobody. Now, w- would you say that that your time and basically say is is remove all limiting beliefs as to what's possible? Would yeah. you say that were you always that way, or did you kind of transform while you were incarcerated to say, you know what, through through reading, you came to realize or have this this epiphany that holy crap, like u- ultimately, I have the ability to do whatever I want to do. Was that already I, in you, or did you experience yeah. the transformation? Yeah, it was. It was. It was already in me. I've been hard headed my whole life. My mama tell you, I've always been hard headed. But what has slowed me down was the drugs, the weed, the alcohol. You know, the women. It was like I've always been hard. Like even when I was selling drugs, like I was great at it. And if you came in my way, I will beat you up. I will <laughs> beat you the fuck up if you get in my way. Do not get in my way. You know. So it was like the violence, going to jail, those things slowed me down, <laughs> you know, it was like, I was always as, as ambitious as I wanted to be, you know, I always had a 4.0 GPA, I always had a good grades, it was just, just, you know, what stopped me was, I was my biggest enemy, you know, getting drunk all the time, you can't be so ambitious if you're super drunk, <laughs> you're going to be passing out, you're not going to be able to function this properly, it was like, 
going to jail, you know, you can't go and do these things if you're in jail or you're in prison. So my whole life, yes, I've always been hard-headed. It was just the things that I was doing, the end goals of them were so small, you know. But now I, I see the bigger goals and what I'm trying to accomplish and the things that I'm doing. The end goal result is, like, it's more spiritual. Like, the end goal for me now is, like I was saying, things that aren't really concrete, like not houses or things that, you know, hey, I want this fancy car, I want a Lamborghini. Like, no, my, my end goal is, is more spiritual. Like, I want to be able to leave these vibes out when, I, when, I, when I'm gone from here. So the end goal just changes from really physical to a spiritual mindset. Hey, Alan, be, only because I, I know that um, you're from Baltimore. I, I saw a YouTube video this morning about Baltimore City, and I think it's going viral now. Somebody took a drone, and they flew it over Baltimore City. And Baltimore City obviously gets a really, really – I don't want to say it gets a bad rap, but, you know, it, it does. What do you think needs to change in the city? We got to invest in a different form of education. You know, the education system we got right now is so structured, it's so outdated, um, it's not really appealing, to be honest, and that has to change. We have to make it exciting to be an entrepreneur. We have to make it, we have to teach real estate, we have to teach financial literacy early. You know, like there's so many children running to the music and thinking that it's okay to, you know, be out here selling drugs. And they need to be educated on even some of these artists. Like, like Yo Gotti, you know, he talks about glorifying or selling drugs, but Yo Gotti went to college for business. You know, a lot of these rappers went to college, <laughs> you know, so you're looking at what they're saying on the music, but people like Rick Ross, he, him and his family was in real estate. Um, you know, he, like, these things need to be talked about outside of the music. Yeah, listen to the music, but let's just research who these people that you're listening to are. Let's see what they've been through, what have they done that's successful. Because it's like, oh, okay, Rick Ross talks about this, but Rick Ross has wing stops all over the nation, and he was in real estate, and he has money here, and he has money there. How can we have money here, there, and there? Teach them that at seven to eight years old, as opposed to being 30 years old, coming from two incarcerations and now trying to do it like me, you know, so make school exciting again. When they're six or seven years old, teach them real estate then, how to own land, like games like Monopoly. Where's Monopoly at? You know, like we need these things to come back. These board games that y'all had in your generation that we don't have anymore. You know, even the cartoons now aren't the same. Like, like the unity of these cartoons is gone. You know, like we at least we had like stuff like Power Rangers, teenagers getting together to fight the bad guy. Like, what the hell do they have now? <laughs> you know, so we need we need the education to be exciting. You know, so it's so exciting that they don't got to be in the street selling drugs. So we got to make we got to make education exciting again. And, and I think that, um, and this is just my personal opinion that Baltimore city is like a powder keg and not in a negative way, but it could be one of the greatest entrepreneurial hubs in the country. Like it's waiting. It's just waiting for the right spark to completely. Got a lot of talent. The city. Yes. Yep. Yep. You know, we got, uh, we got a championship boxer here, Javante Davis, you know, like uh, one of my friends, Kadani Fidel, he's like a poet that travels all throughout the nation telling his stories um, poetically about what he's been through. So there's talent everywhere, man. It's just like you said, for it to be, it just needs to be pushed, man. It needs to be pushed and we need to invest in it more, you know, because we know the school structure is outdated. You know, I know if I'm, if, I'm a, if I'm five, six or even eight, nine years old and you're telling me stuff that really – it can't help fulfill what's going on in my environment right now. What the hell? I want to go outside and sell drugs, man. Cause you're telling me some stuff that ain't going to change my tomorrow in their minds. So we need to be able to have that, have more people who've been through the struggle come and speak and, and not only come and speak, but catch them early, man. Catch them early. I think and Baltimore just had the, the national chess champion, you know, I think he was like 10 years old, 11 years old or something like that. So the talent is there. It just has to be, we have to make it exciting again, you know, and we can. I love that. Um, when, when you look at your, your career going forward, what do you think hold, what obstacles do you think will hold you back? If any. Um, I just got to get around. I just got to be around the right people. And I think that's just temporarily, you know, um, me trying to like now 
me and my father, we actually just got our nonprofit off the ground, um, Go So Live Life Foundation. I did it the first time by myself, um, and I had people around me. But, you know, everybody has their own attention, their own agendas, you know, and I get it. Um, but just being around people who, you know, having the capital to be able to do it, um, which is now becoming more easier for me to do. And just being around those right, skillful people, and we all have that like-minded goal to be able to, to, to get there. You know, I think the higher up, the more I pursue what I'm trying to do, the more network of people that I grow, you know, um, with what skill set I got, what skill set they got, you know, it's just the timing aspect of getting around the right people fast enough to be able to make these things happen, you know. So it's, it's just a matter of when, you know, being around the right people cuts a lot of your time to the goals you're trying to accomplish, you know. So, um, yeah, it's just a matter of me getting around the right people. And is there anybody in particular that comes to mind that, that you can just think of like, cause everybody has like a couple of people, like if I could just have an hour with that person or an hour with this person, or is, is there anybody that comes to mind that like, wow, like that person fits in my, I, mean, I do love, I, I do love Eric Thomas, man. When he, when he, when he talks, man, he, motiv- he motivates the shit out of me, man. You know, if I had an hour with him to talk to him about, you know, what he's been through and what he does, man, that will, that would be impactful. You know, I, you know, I, I'm not close to his, his his level of things, but um, I feel like on this local this local in the Baltimore, when, deep, when people do talk to me and I do go on radio shows, I do speak to people. You know, I have have had my share of people I've motivated and you know helped them with their business goals, and and a lot of the times it's not even like you said, it's not really just the skill, it's just being able to to want it. You mm-hmm. know, if you want it more than somebody who's skillful, you'll pass them. <laughs> you'll pass them. Yeah, because once again, you can just outwork them. And yeah. we all have, you know, when I got started in my career, I was a financial advisor. And I'll never forget, this guy came up and he was like, listen, and, and he wasn't he wasn't the best looking. He didn't have the fanciest suits. He wasn't the, the most well-spoken. But he said, he said, I may not be <laughs> the sharpest knife in the drawer. But nobody will outwork me. And exactly. how he built his career. He, he was just like, I will outwork anybody. Wow. Give me one second. My, my phone's dying, man. I wanted to, I wanted to finish off strong with you. Give me, give me one second. No, you got it. Take as much time as you need. Hey, Jeff, we have any questions out there, bud? Okay, I'm back. Awesome. Um, and, and 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 I think that you know I'm a huge fan of Gary Vaynerchuk, and he talks about the work, the hustle. I mean, he he talks about how he he yeah. thinks drug dealers yeah. make great entrepreneurs because they understand absolutely, God. absolutely. And um, with my, with my nonprofit, I didn't, I'm gonna touch real real brief on it. What I'm gonna do is my father and I, when we when we get it off the ground right this time, it's for it's for disadvantaged youth, you know, youth who who've been troubled. So. Uh, and when I do speak to them, I'm going to talk about the legal hustle. You know, I'm going to tell them how I'm going to use, of course, what I do with real estate. You know, my plug is the lenders. My lenders are the ones who, you know, I, they, they help me. They, they do like investments with me. They like the plug, you know, and then, um, you know, your clients are like if you were selling drugs, you know, instead of it being weed or cocaine or pills, they want houses and they want them now. So you got to be the guy that's ready to get it to get it for them. You know, so I, all that is, is, is the same concept. You want to be able to be up early than everybody on the block. You, you know, if you come up too late, you're going to miss the clients that's trying to buy the houses. So, you know, you just give them those examples and you just transfer it a different way. And you let them know the consequences behind, hey, if you lose this house, yeah, you, you know, you might cost your client some money or, yeah, your client might lose the house. But it's not going to be the same as that police that's locking you up or that guy stick up, stick up. You know, putting that gun behind you and shooting you, it's a different type of consequence. So you might want to learn the legal way instead of the, the negative way. And the hardest part for most people is the paperwork. You know, you and that's why you catch them early. You make it exciting to be able to learn a contract or to learn how to do an LLC, to learn how to trademark your company. All these things I learned in prison. I didn't know nothing about an LLC. I didn't know how to trademark a company or start a nonprofit. I did all this reading books in prison. I came home and started an LLC, a nonprofit, all from being in prison. Wow. <laughs> you know, so you teach them at an early age. You know, we got people that's 30, 40 years old who don't know how to start an LLC right now. But they want to be business. They want to start their own business. 
you got to know the legal structure before you start a, your own business. But if you learn at eight years old or 10 years old how to start it, where to go, how to get it done, knowing your trademark lasts for 15 years before you got to get anyone, you learn all these things when you're early. It's a cakewalk by the time you're my age. I love that. Hey, Alan, how do we, with, with your book, how do we, how do we get a hold of a copy of your book? Like, where do we yeah. go to buy your book? Um, www.prisontoparadise.live. Hey, Jeff, and we're going to make sure we put that down in the feed, Alan, so anybody can find it, whether they catch the replay of this or, um, or even if they, they listen to the podcast on iTunes. Okay. Yeah. You know, Everything that you're doing, I mean, I love, I commend you for it. And it's not commend you like, you know, give you a pat on the back or anything, but I just like, I, I'm in the real estate business and I love your passion and your passion. Like it literally comes through, it comes through, you know, the computer. Like I can see it. I can, feel, <laughs> I can feel your passion to the point where it's like, dude, I let, you know, I want to buy a house with you. So I, I understand <laughs> because because that level of passion and no matter what you do, when that passion comes out, like, dude, everything else becomes easy. Absolutely. And, and you're extremely passionate about what you're doing. And I, I can feel that like, dude, I don't want to get in your way. Like I'm not going to try and stop you. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I, I, I love everything you're doing and, and kudos to you. You know, I appreciate you, for you taking your time out. Um, and, and I think one of the lessons to learn here is like, once again, dude, it doesn't make a difference where you come from. You know, Gary Vee always talks about like the market does, the market does not care. They don't care what color you are. They don't care what your education is. The market does not care. We all have the same opportunities in life. It's who is going to put in the work and take advantage of them. I think I lost you, Al. I'm walking back in the office. Oh, no, you're fine. I can hear you. Uh, I was saying is, is we all have the same opportunities. It's because the market doesn't care who's going to put in the work and take advantage of them. Absolutely. And, and you're proof that, that it can work. It doesn't make – you can come from a jail cell and be successful. You can. And, you can. and that's an amazing story. Appreciate it, man. So appreciate it. I always end with a one last question here, Alan. And once again, I appreciate your time. And it, and it's about fulfillment because you talked through your story about how you were seeking. What I heard is you were seeking external forces to fill your soul with fulfillment. Um. So I ask every guest, like, what does fulfillment mean, and what does that mean for you? Hmm. Fulfillment is legacy. You know, what do you, what do you leave behind? What do you leave behind? You know, cause we're not going to always be here. You know, you, you grind here, you do everything you do on this planet, you know, to leave it behind for whatever reason it may be, whether it be for your children, whether it be for, you know, fame, whether it be for respect. And ultimately fulfillment to me is, is what do you leave behind? You know, what have I, what have I done during this time that I was here on this planet? you know, that will be better meant for the people that will still be here after me, you know. So everything that I do is I, I, leave, I do this so that it can be a better path, especially on the motivational end um, for the next, not just person, but for anybody that has been affected by me and then what I have left behind to spread, to keep it going, you know. So fulfillment is legacy. What do you do when you're gone? That, that's beautiful. How, how do people get a hold of you, Alan? Like where, where do we um, find you? What's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, really, really my phone number. <laughs> to be honest, me being an agent. <laughs> um, I mean, everybody knows my number. So my number is 410-844-1930. I really need to have another phone because I get over 100 calls a day, but I try my best to get to all of them. Um, my email address, too, uh, that's my name, alanjupsher at gmail.com. Um, I kind of be on Facebook, really, but if you really want to connect me, maybe Instagram better. Um Alan Upshur, A L, you know, my name, Alan Upshur. Um, but really, you know, phone number, email, that's my main two. You know, until uh, I guess I get to too big to the point where, you know, I need a hotline number or something. But <laughs> now, but now, yeah, you know, just call, call me. All right. Uh, until he gets his publicist, 
you can he's giving you yeah. he's giving you his direct information and yeah. some will take hopefully, advantage hopefully, of that. Hopefully, that. hopefully this doesn't go viral and I regret that. <laughs> <laughs> hey Alan, we, we'd love to track your journey and see where you are like six months from now. So we'll have you back in our new studio. But once Got it. I, I appreciate your time and dude, let's catch up for lunch sometime because I think we have a lot that uh we can talk about. You got it. I like buffalo wings. You got it. <laughs> All right. I like Buffalo wings too. The hotter, the better, man. All right, man. Thanks a lot. All right. Peace out. Have a great evening, Alan. You too. All right. Thank you. Bye.